Okay, hello and welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's special presentation of the possibilities, realities, and the new and exciting technologies for our industry. Uh, this webinar may assist you in deciding what technology is best utilized and implemented for the type of business that you operate. Uh, my name is Gray, I'm from Control Logic, and I will be assisting Jason Lee from GE Automation and Controls, who will be your host this afternoon. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to quickly go over a few house rules for those that haven't attended one of our webinars before. Uh, microphones are not enabled, so we can't hear you, but if you do have a question, um, you're encouraged to type them in the Q&A window. Uh, this window should be located within the top toolbar to your right. If you're using a mobile device, hopefully you'll be able to see it on your home screen. Um, feel free to ask questions at any time throughout the presentation, but keep in mind that all questions will be answered at the end. And if you happen to think of any additional questions after the presentation has ended today, or if you want more information on a particular product or item, uh, please send us an email to our sales team at sales at control-logic.com.au or call us on 1-800-557-705. Uh, today we've estimated a time of around 40 minutes, so this will be a quick summary of GE's current technology. Um, with that, I'll pass you over to Jason to kick off the technology update webinar. Thanks very much, Gray. Thanks, uh, to Control Logic, for hosting this event. Uh, great to see so many people attending. Uh, we've got some good numbers uh, attending today, so that's fantastic. Uh, so, uh, for those who don't know me, it's Jason Lee from uh, GE uh, Automation and Controls so on Brisbane base. Uh, so, if anybody uh, is interested in any of this technology, um, you can either contact myself, um, we can get those contact details to you, or to anyone at Control Logic. Okay, so uh, what we really wanted to cover today was some of their new products that we've released this year. So we've had uh, a bunch of new uh, new devices um, released and some new features on some existing devices. So really just want to spend a little bit of time going through some of those some of those things and um, showing you what's new, or the latest and greatest. Uh, so first up, we've got a, a couple of new controllers that we've released this year. Uh, so the difference between these controllers and our uh, current uh, existing RX3i controllers is that we've now got some standalone controllers. Uh, so what that means is instead of them being on a rack base like our RX3i today, uh, these guys actually just can flip, flip straight into a DIN rail and um, connect all your IO and everything up via proxy net. So the first one is uh, our brand new CPE100. So uh, this model is only a couple of months old. We've released this around uh, August or September. Um, so it is very, very new to us. Uh, it's very, very small and compact, so it's uh, it's a small end of our controllers, so it's, it sits at that low low end uh, performance and low cost as well. So it's it's a nice small controller that we've been waiting for for quite a while. So it sits only 39 millimeters wide on that DIN rail, and it's about 140 by 140 millimeters high and deep. Uh, it'll still run up to a, a couple of thousand I/O without a problem. Uh, realistically, on a controller this size, between 500 and 1,000 I/O uh, it should be more than sufficient uh, and and with that we can connect all our IO up directly uh, via remote IO uh, and in our case it's PropyNet. So we can put eight PropyNet drops on this, uh, so whether that be IO or whether it be um, uh, a drive or another device, the, the breakdown on those ports um, we can configure. Um, now if I just take you through the, the physical uh, look of the of the controller, so on the, on the top here we've got a USB port now currently that port isn't actually enabled, uh, so future use we may be able to upload and download programs or, or some other other mechanism, but uh, at the moment it's disabled. So we've got a top LAN port here, so we've actually got two physical LANs on this controller. So the top LAN port uh, uh, the first network, so for that you would use that to connect to your um, to connect to your laptop for programming, or you might connect it to an HMI or to a SCADA. And the bottom three ports uh, can also be used via a standard internet, but also you can configure them from broadband. So with that, that means that we can run a, a, a ring to policy or start policy directly out of that network switch port. Uh, so then we've got uh, obviously power and uh, communication stuff on the front there as well. Uh, the controller also has an RSP32 port on the bottom of it, however, currently the port is disabled. So you find that quite often we bring out a, a product with uh, all the bells and whistles, but uh, they're not necessarily all enabled uh, initially with the first release. Uh, so the controller has a meg of memory on it, so that's more than enough to run a, a reasonable sized program on that, and, and with that we can get low millisecond scan rates on that too. So uh, they run really nice, really efficient, and it's, uh, and it's a, a good bang for your buck really in that small space. 
Uh, operating temperatures, so unlike our existing controllers which run about 0 to 60 degrees Celsius, we can run these from minus 40 to 70. So whether you're running it in the snow or out in the desert, you should really be able to run this um, in, in some pretty good places without needing extra uh, environmental um, uh, air conditioning or anything like that for it. Uh, now, from a risk point of view, uh, both this and the other controller I'll show you in a second uh, have both got Achilles Level 2 certification. Now, Achilles may not be familiar to uh, a lot of people on the call, but what we've got is um, uh, Achilles is actually a certification by a company called WorldTech. Now, WorldTech is actually a company that GE owns. However, we keep that at arm's length, and uh, we'll find that most automation vendors actually certify their products uh, with this same company. Um, so whether it be Schneider, Siemens, uh, Yokogawa, Emerson, they're all certify their products with, uh, with Achilles uh, certification. So that, what it, that actually means is uh, the certification uh, goes through all the, the devices and checks to make sure they're not vulnerable to attacks. So whether that be intrusion detection or, or, or brute force attacks, they're checking all these ports. So they'll check the, the USB port, the, the LAN ports and, and all the rest of it to make sure that you can't um, put a corrupted program on there or, or uh, hack into it basically. Uh, and with that, we've also got a, a TPM or a Trusted Platform Module chip on board as well. So what that does is it actually stops you from downloading uh, dodgy firmware onto the onto there and, and other things that can cause problems to the client. And that secure boot uh, also then uh, when it boots up, it actually checks uh, against um, known, uh, checks the checksum on that against the known correct one from that firmware version and things like that. So really good high level secure platform. Now, the, although these, uh, these controllers are new, they are still a standard PAC systems controller, so they do still do sit into the standard RxGI range, um, range of controllers. So what that means is if you've got an existing program running on uh, any of our other 90, uh, uh, 9030s or RxGIs for that matter, you can actually port that code directly into this controller. So that means uh, if, you've been work if you've had any blocks that you've currently got or a library of blocks, uh, anything in your tool chest, you can feel free that you can drag and drop these onto this controller and they will continue to work. Uh, so you can you know, leverage your existing applications, essentially. So with that being a PAC systems controller, we can also, also run standard languages. So the ladder, the structured text, function block, diagram, and C. So all the standard languages that were there before will still continue onto this controller. Uh, from the protocol point of view, uh, PropyNet um, is on there, as I said before. It does support MRP, so that means you can actually run a loop. Uh, a redundant loop in through say port two and then port three on this controller. I'll show you a network diagram in a second. Uh, so it gives you that uh, extra level of redundancy should you need it. Uh, EGD comms, so we can talk PLC to PLC or PLC to IO or SCADA uh, via that standard EGD mechanism as you've uh, been used to doing in the past. There is also Modbus running on there, so we can run Modbus TCP and uh, feeling new onto all of our controllers now is running UA server on these, so that means if you're SCADA or other um, other devices that are IPC UA clients, we can talk and browse to the IPC server, IPC UA server running on there. Uh, and as I said, security and the number of IO points and everything else have already covered. So this just gives you an idea of the architecture we can use. So a PropyNet running an MRP loop, which is nice, so that means that if you happen to lose any one of these devices, the, the ring will self-heal and you won't lose any of the other devices on the network. In our case here, we've got an HMI plugged into the top port, so uh, we've got a nice quick panel sitting there. Um, of this I.O., uh, anything that supports PropyNet you can use. However, in, in this low-cost uh, solution, this RSTI EP uh, I.O., which I'll cover uh, in a few minutes, is, is a nice low-cost solution that, uh, that could be used. Okay, so next up, we've got our, uh, our CPE 400. Now this model's been released for a little bit longer, it's almost 12 months old. It was released in January last year. Uh, it's a little bit bigger, uh, 55 millimeters wide and about 160 by 150 millimeters deep and high. However, it packs a lot bigger punch for, the, for, uh, for its size. So we can run well over 10,000 IO on this without a problem. It's, it's right at that high end of controller. So if anyone's familiar with the, the CPE 400, uh, sorry, the CPE 330, it's essentially running a, a slightly faster CPU than that. Uh, so anything that runs on our currently our top end will, will more than adequately adequately run on this controller. So with that, obviously, uh, as I said before, this is a standalone controller. So any uh, any I/O that you may have in an existing rack on an existing project uh, can't be used directly. Um, however, you could easily put that into a remote Profinet uh, Profinet scanner rack and connect it up via Profinet. 
So just looking at the front panel on this, uh, we've got two USB ports, uh, same as the CPE100, they are not currently enabled. Uh, at the top here, we've got an LED display. So that will give you your IP address and some basic information that allows you to uh, stop and start the controller by some of these buttons here. So these buttons are both buttons and lights uh, along on some of these uh, here as well. Top LAN ports, the same as the CPE100, you plug that into your SCADA or you plug it into your programming computer. The second two LAN ports, they are uh, PropyNet. So we've only got two PropyNet LAN ports on this controller, but more than adequate to run that MRP loop again. The bottom two ports, uh, we've now got redundancy on there, and I'm going to cover redundancy shortly, so I won't, um, I won't jump in uh, to that just yet. So 32 PropyNet scanners on this, uh, on this controller. So uh, I will show you the disadvantages and advantages compared to the 330 compared to the 400 in a few minutes, but 32 drops compared to the, the, the 8 on the CPE100. 64 mega uh, user memory, so that's, uh, that's got a, a lot of memory in there. And uh, very very fast scan rates. Now all the ports on these on the network on this are all gigabit ports this time. So there are 100 meg ports on the CPE 100, but they are gigabit on the 400. And again, they're uh, minus 40 to plus 70 degrees temperature rating on this controller. So everything else, uh, I won't repeat that uh, what we've done on the CPE 100. The same same risk profile security on that. And given it's a PAC systems controller RX3i, it can run everything else that the that the RX3i current models do today. It's the same within here. We've got uh, we've got those same same protocols, so the MRP, the EGD, uh, and all the other protocols. Uh, we've got a capacitor bank uh, energy pack on the uh, on the 400. So those that are familiar with the, the energy packs that we've got on the um, the CPE330, they're very similar. Now, from an architecture point of view, where the 400 differs and its big strong point is that as of the middle of November, the CP400 is now capable of running redundancy. So that's huge for, uh, for us. Uh, we believe it's probably the cheapest redundant solution, redundant controller solution on the market today, certainly from the big vendors anyway. Um, we can still run our redundancy in our CPE330s, but if you're looking for a cost-effective solution, the 400, what, where, it, uh, where it comes into its own is that it really doesn't require that backplane, the fiber modules to connect them together anymore and the power supply and everything else that goes with that with that cost. You just simply need the two controllers and they plug into each other via an ethernet cable. Now, it does have the disadvantage of that ethernet cables are not going to be as fast as the as the fiber, um, but it still will swap over and, and sync those controllers within 300 milliseconds. So it's it's definitely uh, a sort of very, very high level uh, redundant controller for a lot of solutions. Maybe uh, not a solution if you're running a robotics plant or something like that, but uh, if you're running a, a slow moving water processing or a, or a mining process or something like that, it's, it's definitely something to consider using. And, and, it's, and it might not be something that you've considered using in the past. Redundancy might have been that extra expense that you really didn't need. But if you, uh, if you consider the price of this and the fact that it is uh, a fraction of the cost of our uh, as and other competitors redundant solutions if you're just simply looking for that little uh, little bit extra uh, peace of mind on your site then uh, then it's certainly a way to go and if you're using an rx3i today you can take the existing code put it into this add its redundancy and away you go uh, and that profit net solution works uh, exactly the same uh, as, the, as the cp100 so we've got the mrp into there and i will cover in a in a, in a second this little cloud symbol up the top Now, the 330 versus the 400, as I've said, uh, the 330 will uh, will fail over a lot quicker because it does have those uh, fibre modules. So it'll fail over in only uh, two or three milliseconds, whereas the 400 will fail over in about 300 milliseconds. Uh, the, the 330 can take uh, up to 255 uh, PropyNet drops on its redundant solution. Uh, however, if you're using MRP, that's reduced to 128. And if you're using uh, the CPU as its, uh, or the PropyNet, controller on the CPU as its MRP master. It'll only take uh, 64 devices. However, it's still a lot more than the, the 32 on the 400. The 400, however, has that price point difference. It's compact. It fits really nicely into a, into a small cabinet. Its temperature range is, uh, is minus 40 to plus 70. So weighing up the, the pros and cons between the two, uh, we've certainly got uh, covered, covered all bases there as far as that cheap redundant solution and that high-end redundant solution goes. Now, the, cloud, the little cloud symbol that I mentioned before. Now, the CP400 is very, very unique in the market in that it's not just uh, a PLC or a controller. 
just looking at the architecture inside it, the CPE 400 has a four core uh, processor with it. So two of those cores are, as you would see today, a PLC. They're running the, the comms on the PLC. They're running the controller on the PLC. However, there's still two cores left. And what we've got is we've actually got a hypervised, um, we've got a hypervised uh, operating system on this controller. Uh, so the, the two cores are running the VX Works, their standard the controller operating system, and the other two is running a real-time uh, um, cloud-based data utility. So basically what that means is we can send data directly out of this controller up to the, the GE cloud. Uh, and potentially in the future, that's going to be, uh, we may even be looking at other clouds as well. So what that means is we can get uh, collaborate data straight out of this controller. There's a WAN port or what we call a, a field agent port on the back of it. And we can send things like the uh, the operating specs on the on the controller. So we can get the fault tables, we can get its scan rate, we can get its uh, any information back out of that controller and we can simply send that straight to the cloud. And then by any of your devices that you may have, whether it be an iPad or a, or a phone, or a laptop, we can you can simply just log into a website and pull that data down. Now that's at the very basic level. At a bit more of an advanced level, we can actually collaborate with information on the internet and run your process accordingly. So what that might mean is you can spot check the electricity price, and if that electricity price spikes, we can get that information collaborated on the cloud down to the edge, or what we call at the front end of the controller, and you know, turn it off and on your process or adjust it accordingly. That's just one simple example. It might be the weather. Let's say there's a, there's a storm coming or there's a flood warning and that's on the internet, we can stop and start uh, pumps accordingly as well. Now, uh, currently you might be using a SCADA to do that, you might be using uh, manual operations to do that, but this is all automatic. So it's essentially taking the, uh, the that internet of things uh, or the industry 4.0 concept and this is real live in the field running today. So uh, it's still very new to GE. Uh, it's it's something that we're have been working on for the past year or so. We've definitely got people currently using it, uh, but it's only going to get bigger and better from here. So we'll uh, kind of watch this space. If the if the internet uh, having your controller plugged into the internet, internet something that scares you, rest assured it's going to be something that's going to happen. Whether it be in two years' time or ten years' time, it's it's everything these days is on the uh, on the internet. Even if that means your laptop on site or your phone that's on site is currently uh, connected to the internet while your computer's plugged into your PLC. Uh, it it's all comes down to security and how things are set up, and uh, and security is absolutely at the front front end of uh, of our development on this. So our controllers, where they stand. So if we have a little look at this, currently as of last sorry as of last this time last year we had a CPE three hundred five, we had a CPE three hundred ten, and a CPE three hundred thirty. They were really our only three controllers at that end. We did have some Versamax and some more smaller end controllers. But at their higher end RX3I controllers, those are the three. As of uh, as of January this year, we added our CPE 400, uh, and as I said, as of last month, we've now got that in a redundant controller fashion. The CPE 100 was added in September, uh, and that's added to that lo lower end uh, of our controllers. What I'm uh, I'm looking forward to is this month we're going to release a, a CPE 315. Uh, sorry, 115. Now the CPE 100, to give you an idea, has that one meg of memory. The CPE 115 will have 1.5 meg of memory. Now that in itself might not sound terribly interesting, and uh, unless you're running out of memory on your controller, it probably won't be. However, the big thing for the CPE 115 will be as of quarter one next year. And if you remember, I, I said that quite often we release products and add features later. The CPE 115, as of quarter one, will have DMP3 on it. So that's really exciting for us. We've had a lot of people wanting a, a small uh, DMP3 controller, especially those that have got existing uh, GE controllers on them. They really want to be able to use those uh, existing blocks. They don't want to have to add an RTU onto site. Uh, so everything should be able to get done in that standalone uh, CPE uh, 115. Throw some I.O. onto that and there's your uh, essentially your RTU. Uh, and the other thing I've been told that the CPE 400 at some stage next year, I haven't been given a date on it, but it's looking to have uh, DMP3 on it as well. So that kind of rounds out that high end and that low end. And what we have uh, also being added at some stage this month, um, that could could end up rolling into January, but uh, CPE 302. So for those that know the CPE 305, it's got five meg of memory. The CPE 310 has 10 meg of memory. The 330 has 64 meg of memory. Uh, the 302, uh, as you may have guessed, has got two meg of memory. So it's it's about 20% cheaper than the 305. Uh, so if you don't quite need the grunt or the memory of the 305 and you want to save a few dollars, we're bringing that uh, slightly lower end in there. So it sits in between the 100 and 305. So that will round out our controllers. So by mid-year, we should have all these up and running with all of these new features that I've just been telling you. So just to give you an idea of a few other products, so that covers our PLCs. Uh, 
Just wanted to run through a few other, um, I will be demonstrating how to configure them in a few minutes, but before I do that, uh, our RSTR EPIO. So we've had this out for, I think, nearly two years now, 18 months to two years, something like that. So this is our high performance slice IO. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on here. Um, so this was mainly to cover some of those new CPU, CPU releases today. But the RSTR EP is a, is a nice, um, compact, uh, it's hot swappable, it's uh, at that lower price end. Um, for the I.O. It's got a number of different comms, um, comms features with it. It runs Profinet, it runs Modbus, uh, so we, and Profibus and EPCAT. So we've got uh, a number of communication uh, options for it. You can put up to 64 modules on a rack. Uh, it's um, For those that were familiar with our standard RSTI I.O., it's uh, got a smaller footprint because we can run um, 16 channel cards in this uh, form factor rather than the eight that we had, had in, the, uh, in the other. And um, and we can we can run over 2,000 I/O points in a single network adapter. So this this is a, a nice I/O that would sit beautifully with any of our controllers really. But if you're looking at for a low end, uh, low cost solution um, at that at still that fast performance, then it sits beautifully with the, the CPE 100. Next we've got a, a range of switches. Now I know that uh, the Control Logic sell a, a number of other brands, um, so I'm not going to push this on features. Uh, except to say that this is a, uh, from a, from one feature in particular, that this is a unique, uh, to us is this a Profinet switch. Now Profinet as a protocol doesn't actually require any special switching. It can, you can run a, a, a standard $100 Netgear switcher and, and Profinet will run fine across that network. However, uh, what this switch does being a Profinet enabled switch is it's actually a Profinet device. So where that, what that means is that you can actually put this into the, uh, the Profinet network. So in your PLC network, you can add your GSDML file for those that are familiar with it, and you can add it as a device on your PLC network. So that means that you can actually monitor all the status on this switch. So I've uh, I've done a bit of testing on this, these switches myself. So I've written a couple of test programs and an HMI screen to go with it, where I was simply just just pulling out the a network port out of say port one and plugging into port two, and you would see the lights change on that front screen. So obviously that means I can pull alarms out there if someone wants to change ports. If it turned the network switch off, I was getting alarms. So that, uh, there's plenty of uh, third-party software that you can use today that, that you can pull out diagnostics, but I think it's, uh, it's really nice to be able to pull it all into one solution, have your controller pull all that data back up to your SCADA if needed, and have all that uh, in one common place. So a uh, new range of propping net switches. So if there's any, anything interesting there, feel free to, uh, to get in touch with us. There's, uh, there's a number of different models. There's a, uh, just looking at these little pictures here, uh, there's, uh, the top ports are in fiber and the bottom ports are copper. So there's a four fiber, six copper, uh, two fiber, eight copper, and four fiber, um, ten copper. And sorry, I should actually say that the top ports aren't actually copper. They're, uh, they actually can, you can actually plug, um, uh, a fiber or copper into those should you need to. So they're configurable. And, uh, then we've also got a, a new range of VFDs. So again, I'm not going to push these on features to, except to say that this is the first Profinet switch that I have seen on the market that actually supports Profinet redundancy. So uh, from a GE automation and controls business, we haven't had a range of, uh, range of drives uh, before, um, and we have had several occasions even this year where we've had projects have required um, that have had redundancy. So what I uh, mean by Profinet system redundancy is when we've got a redundant controller architecture. So to get that and to run an MRP loop, the device that's in that MRP uh, network loop needs to be uh, Profinet system redundant compliant. So there is no other switches that I know of, sorry, no other drives that I know of on the market. And I stand to be corrected if you can find one, but we had a couple of projects this year and the drives that we had on there, we could not plug them into the MRP network. So what that happened to happen with those is that we actually had to run them by Modbus off that top Ethernet port, uh, going back to the architecture, and we had to run them as a single point of failure, essentially. So what this will mean with these drives is that we can actually put them into the loop and they'll be part of, uh, part of that ring network. So that just adds again that little extra level. So if you've got uh, half a dozen drives on a network, MRP loop, if you lose one drive, you're not going to lose the other five. Uh, so doing it by Modbus, you know, you've got that single point of failure, whether it be one of the drives in a, in a, in a line topology or if you've got a, a switch in a network topology, here it gives you that, that just that little bit extra fail safe. Uh, and they're, uh, they're coming out in a 0.75 to 250, 250 kilowatt, uh, and they'll be out sometime early next year. Uh, lastly, a quick panel. So quick panel's been out for a long, long time. Quick panel plus, uh, as the latest iteration of those, uh, those panels has been out for, I think, two to three years now and, uh, continuing to add a, a new features to it. So we've now got VNC. So if you've had any of these panels in the past, uh, especially some of the earlier models, 
um, just rest assured that any of the new features that we put onto these are purely upgradable by firmware. So a lot of people have uh, been wanting to have remote connection to their panels. BNC is something that's super easy to do. Uh, I know there's other manufacturers out there that to, to get remote access to your panel, you've got to buy licenses. So VNC purely works so you can get an app on your phone, you can you can download a, a very small program onto your laptop, you turn the VNC server on on the panel and you can connect to it. Uh, it's also, uh, we've also got an SNMP uh, to enable you to publish tags directly out of the panel now into an SNMP server. So I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And HTML5 dashboards is a, is a new feature as well. Uh, some of these new features, when I say new, they have been out for uh, 12 months or so. But uh, but although there's a lot of people out there that have had panels and have had them for a couple these panels for a couple of years and, and may not have realised that there's there's new features now that can be used. And email uh, we had email on some of our older panels. We actually took it out of the out of our feature set for a little while because we wanted to make sure it was secure. It has now come back in. It's uh, it's via scripting, but we've now got SSL security on our email. So some of our new features there. Now for those that aren't familiar with our panels, uh, we can uh, we've got five sizes. We've got a six inch, two to a fifteen inch panel. Uh, they're multi-touch, so they're the only panel that I know of on the market that are actually uh, that are actually have got that iPad looking feel. So we can pinch and zoom, you can swipe left and right to change your pages. Now on a big screen, you may have plenty of real estate to put buttons, but uh, on a seven-inch screen, for example, it's um, it's uh, something that you can do away with half your buttons now. You can just swipe left and right to change your screens. I don't know how many people I'm sure that uh, all of those 20-something year olds or, or late teens that turn up to site now, first thing they do is turn up to a panel and start swiping. To change page as well. We've got now got a panel that will allow you to do that. And also being a capacitive screen that enables those features means they're, uh, they're a, they can last a lot longer than a, than a standard resistive screen as well. Now the, the panels that we've got uh, have got a lot more capability than just a screen. We can also use run them as a controller. So I know that there's, there's probably people on this call that have currently used this these uh, the control engine in the panel. But if you wanted an even cheaper solution than running, say, a CPE 100 and some I.O. onto it, we can actually plug that I.O. directly into the panel. There's a lot of people that may want to separate that control to the HMI, but those that are looking for a cheap solution can plug that, that, um, that I.O. straight into the panel. Uh, run the control engine, uh, standard uh, five standard IEC languages on there as well, and, uh, and away you go. Uh, and we can talk from PLC to PLC, PLC to HMI. Um, these lines on the screen, um, I've actually got a full presentation. So if anybody is interested in any sort of strange combination of getting a panel talking to Excel or SQL Server or doing something like that, uh, I've got an entire presentation on this I'm more than happy to share or even take through anybody on some training on this. Our panels are incredibly flexible. Uh, so not only can they talk obviously to a GE PLC, um, here's just a few of the other uh, here's just a few of the other drivers that we've got on there. So there's over 60 drivers, these are just a few of them that it can talk to. So if you Still using Alan Bradley on site, and I won't hold it against you. You're, uh, you should definitely consider looking at, at, a, at one of our GE panels to sit on top of it. Um, I've heard a lot of good things, and a lot of people have used other other manufacturers and have changed the, the GE panels. Are very very impressed with them. So a lot of lot of compliance on there, and uh, and yeah, definitely a lot of drivers. Okay, so before I take everyone through some of the new uh, the last couple of slides, I just want to take a few minutes and just demonstrate. Um, what's new in our software? So this is the latest version of the software we have. It's Machine Edition 9.5. If you're still using anything prior to uh, 8.6, you would never have seen this toolbar before. So we've got a ribbon bar on here now. It's that uh, sort of Microsoft Office look and feel to it. Uh, so from version 9 onwards, it, it can now use this. And uh, I must say it took me a, a month or two to get used to it the first time I used it. But now when I go back to the old version, I, uh, I wonder why I never uh, changed sooner. So it's, it's really nice, easy to find. All the buttons are nice. Uh, easy, easy to use. Um, even this little river, uh, this little bar at the top, you can actually customize that and add your own buttons in there uh, for any of these buttons down the bottom. So that's that's the latest. Uh, 9.5 SIM 5 is actually the very latest version. So make sure uh, definitely um, run the latest SIM if you've got uh, if you haven't um, if you if you want not to, to update your SIM very regularly. Because uh, one thing I will say is that if you even if you've got 9.5, you won't see the CPE 100 in there until you've got I think SIM 4 it came out in. Uh, or maybe even in SIM 5 actually. So uh, it's not just the, the bug fixes and things that we put into our SIMs, it's new features as well. So just showing you the, the new processes in here. And if anybody wants at any stage uh, to do a lunch and learn on site, we're, we're really happy to, to come to the site and, uh, and or we can uh, do it remotely if, uh, if it's not convenient for, for anybody. We can, we can spend a half a day or a few hours 
taking through the software if you, even if you just want a bit more familiarity around some of the new controllers, or if, even if there's any questions that you've had in the past, uh, we can more than happy to supply my contact details or any of the control logic guys as well. So just showing you here, we've now got our two new controllers. So the Rackless controller is the CPE 400. Now that you will see in version uh, version nine, so PME version nine. Uh, yeah, the, the standalone controller is the CPE 100. That is currently only in uh, version 9.5. So uh, if you've got uh, software support, which I know a lot of you will have, um, you've got you're more than entitled to your free upgrades uh, supported in there. Get get onto the latest, and um, you can add new controllers into your portfolio. Uh, so adding either of those will add their new targets in. I've already created these before, just to save myself a, a few minutes. So the CP100, from the logic down, it's exactly the same as you're used to running any other RX3i. So you'll see that uh, with the hardware configuration, we've got our four ports. Now they mirror exactly what's on the front of the, of the controller. So that top port's the Ethernet. The, the second three ports, so you can see they've switched here. So the, the, the third and the fourth port are purely just attached to that port number two. And they've got number two, if you can even read that, there's number two written down there um, on those uh, second, third, and fourth ports. So that's their Profinet ports, and you configure it exactly the same as the inspector window if you were, as if you were creating a, a PNC uh, card or a, a CPE 330 internal ports. Ethernet port at the top, uh, as per normal. Click on that, and you add your IP address. So essentially, that's uh, it's not much different than having an ETM card and a PNC card that we've had in the past, they're just all on board. On the, on the PLC and any of the blocks down below are logically exactly the same as you've used in the past. Now, if I look at the same on the CPE 400, we've got uh, five ports this time, plus we've got that field agent port down the bottom. So we've got our Ethernet port, we've got our Profinet switch port, so that's number two, and we've got our, our redundant port. So if you have put the latest uh, latest firmware on here, uh, sorry, the latest SIM on here, as of SIM 5, redundancy was enabled. So if I now right click, uh, and I want to enable that redundancy, sorry, not right click, I get into my inspector window down the bottom, I can enable redundancy, and give it a second. You can see now I've got primary and secondary hardware configs in there. So there you go, you've already set up for your hardware. All you need to do is add an Ethernet IP address for your uh, for that LAN there, and you're ready to go download to both controllers, which is a separate task, and you um, and you can, then turn the primary off if you want, and the secondary will run. There's a few a little bit, a few more things to it than that. You've got to make sure your transfer list is set up for those that are familiar with redundancy, but in a nutshell, that's uh, that's really as simple as that. And you want to go back, if you've got a redundant solution, you want to take it back to normal, just turn it off, confirm that you want to do that, and back to normal. So there you go. There's, uh, there's your two controllers, super simple to set up. Everything's on board now. You're adding any devices to those Profinet networks on either of them, you right click and just simply add an IO device. And from there you can add any IO that you're, uh, that you may have selected, whether that be a, a drive from ABB or whether it be a Siemens Centron power meter or a, hopefully a GIO or a, a new GE drive in there. So that's the two PLCs. Now very, very quickly I'll just show you the quick panel. Some of the new features on here. There's the HTML5 dashboards on there. So we can click on that. You accept the Google terms and conditions. So we are, I would say, a little bit restricted on what we can do at the moment. Uh, it's, it's kind of in its early days. Um, I'm sure they'll add to it. Uh, but currently we can add uh, a nine by, sorry, three by three, so a nine squares in the grid. So if we want to put a, grid, a, a gauge on here. Now what this actually does is uh, the page as you see it in front of you here, if you log on to the IP address slash um, dashboard, and there's a port, I can't remember the port number is, but uh, you plug that into any browser, and and away you go. You basically bring this up. So if you wanted to give an overview of the plants, just some basic stats to a plant manager or a supervisor or something like that, you can create some very very simple things that they can just pull it up and have it running live on that uh, on that web page. Um, you just simply add your variables down the side and hit apply, and away you go. Uh, and then you, um, oh, I've turned it off. Sorry, I need to add this back in before it'll actually. I'll need to, I need to add at least one. In here, oh, okay. Sorry for this. Is a technical glitch. <laughs> it was working for me yesterday. Basically, uh, where it's got unsupported data type, I need to just double check what I've clicked on there. Um, it just allows you to whether you want to refresh it every minute, every hour, every day, so that data doesn't have to be continuously refreshed. And it publishes those pages onto the panel, and then essentially allows you to, to log in and view them. SNMP variables. 
we can add any of the variables that you want in there, and they're published up to an SNMP manager. Um, both of these two features, the HTML uh, dashboards and the SNMP, the only other thing you need to do is just physically on the panel, you just need to enable them. Web documents. Now, the web documents is a really cool new feature uh, that basically allows you to create an HTML page. So if you're a, a bit of a guru on, on web programming, you can create an HTML uh, page. You basically just drop it into this directory. That directory is essentially uh, downloaded to the, the panel. And then, again, you just log into the panel IP address slash that, uh, that URL, that, um, that HTML uh, web page name. Uh, and that in itself isn't terribly exciting, except that then you can start adding variables in. So you can substitute tags on your page with live data. So that variable substitution, if you have a look over on the side here, is essentially you set it up as per the highlighted line that I put, and you can put, uh, the sky's the limit really what you can put. Obviously there's restrictions on physical size of the web page, uh, but you can create um, a nice picture, whether it be pictures, graphs, tables, all your data, and again, it's something that a manager might want to look at, or you might want to do run stats off your plant and simply give anybody who's got access to it, they can, they can browse to that uh, that page. Really nice. So if you're a bit of a guru uh, HTML programmer, I'd love to see some demos because uh, I've, I've had run a couple of really basic hello world type demos uh, with a couple of tags that I've pulled from a PLC to an HMI up to it. But that's about as far as my demos go uh, so far. Uh, and uh, just to, to, to let you know, I've got no physical hardware in front of me at the moment, so uh, there's no live demo as such today. So that's the uh, that's the, the, the new software. So I'll just go back to uh, the PowerPoint for a minute. Just with a couple of minutes left, I just wanted to, to take this last chance. Now that's the uh, the software, I've already shown you that, so I don't need to, to do that. Really want to take this opportunity for everybody on the call, because I don't very often get a group this size uh, all in one spot, um, just to make sure everybody is aware that the 9030 series of PLCs, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with them, they uh, have been matured for the last two years. They will be discontinued as of the 31st of December. So you've got, what is the date today? You've got 24 days uh, minus Christmas. So you've really only got a week or two uh, to, to protect your plant. Now, don't, I'm not playing scary tactics here. Uh, it's, it's your plant uh, or your customer's plant. Um, but if you've still got 9030 stuff out there, spare parts are few and far between as of the, the 1st of January. Now, we may have some uh, a little bit of spare stock. Control Logic, I know, has a little bit of spare stock, but it doesn't mean we've got the exact uh, item that you've got in your plant. And for those that are not, uh, that may have seen a 9030 around and not realise how easy and quick it is to change, um, if you look at this picture here, uh, the bottom bottom the bottom rack, let me just turn my little highlighter on. It might be a uh, laser pointer. It might be easier for you to see it. The bottom rack there has got a serial port on it. The top rack has a PCI and a serial slot on it. So that means we can take all the I.O. from the 9030. When I say all, I mean most. Uh, there is a few cards that can't. And we can drop them straight into an RX3i rack. So we can swap that out. And if you want the lower cost, we can get a 30, the new 302 CPU that comes out or a 305. We can put in our power supply and our backplane. Everything else we can copy directly out. So that means you're not relying on that CPU dying. So if that 9030 CPU dies in your plant, as of the 1st of January, it's going to be very, very difficult. And we've, uh, we've been putting those warnings out for the last two years, so this is not uh, not new. Um, but I know that there are dozens and dozens, hundreds of sites still in Australia that are still running 9030s. Now, some of those are costs. Some of those guys that have shut half their plant down and have got spares for the other half, and they reckon they'll keep going for you know, another year or two. But I just want to make it very, very clear that it's, uh, it's very easy to change over. And uh, for most jobs, I won't say all, but for most jobs, uh, and um, you know, you really need to migrate those as soon as possible. Um, so if you can't, uh, if you can't do it between now and Christmas, which is very unlikely. Now talk to us in the new year, or talk to us now. Let's start that let's start that discussion. If nothing else, we're happy to, to come out and talk to your customers as well. If you uh, if you need to, we can demonstrate just how easy it is from a software point of view. Uh, this is literally how easy it is. Uh, you, we can take stuff that's in this old DOS window here. We can pull that into our, our latest window software without a problem. That's just a, an easy uh, an easy change. And then if we're changing that family, if uh, there's, a, there's a template in here or, or a project family, we can literally change that from a, a 9030 to an RX3i family and, and everything's done for you. It spits out this report at the bottom. These blue lines on here just means the warning. And you might get one or two red lines in there if you've got uh, if you've got some incompatible hardware or or a, a couple of lines of code that need change, and away you go. Download it to the new controller. You don't even have to unwire that that uh, those I/O cards. You can literally drop those I/O cards out, put the new rack in, and plug your I/O cards back into your rack most of the time. So that's uh, that's really all I had to cover. Uh, at the end of the day, you'll end up with something bright and and, and new like this uh, CPE 330 here. 
may not be a redundant solution, but um, uh, but yeah, that's that's basically most of mine covered. Any questions? Feel free to uh, feel free to put them in the chat window. Thanks, Jason. So um, technology certainly has come a long way by the sounds of things. Um, so if you do have a question, now is your time to ask them. Uh, you just type, start typing those questions into the Q and A window, um, and I'll read them out based on the order they came in. So we do have a question here um, already, Jason. So the question is: Can you advise what version of DMP3 the CPE100 will support? Um, that is a good question. I probably should come armed with that question, given that DMP3 is a hot topic for us at the moment. Um, I can follow that up for anybody that's interested, um, but I can tell you that the specs that are on our EDS uh, 001 card, so that's our, our card that fits into the likes of this rack in front of us, the specs are exactly the same. The only difference being that it's about half the number of data points that it will accept, because obviously it's a lot smaller controller, it's not a standalone dedicated MP3 controller. But if you look up the specs on the IC695 EDS 001, I've been told that the specs should be identical. They're basically in, uh, taking that same code stack and putting it onto the CPU 100. Okay, it's so another question here. Uh, what cloud systems can the field agent on the CPE 400 connect to, or is it just CreateX or, or any other third party cloud systems supported? Okay, that is interesting. So currently it is only CreateX. Um, they are talking about getting to other clouds. Uh, but with that, so when I mentioned before about the two cores being on, sorry, the four cores being on the CPE 400, the uh, the other two cores being dedicated to that cloud connection. There is talk, and it's in its very early days, and I don't like really talking too much about this stuff when it's there's nothing physical there yet, but the, it, technically it does have the capability of running anything on those other two cores. Um, so there is talk about putting other data collection tools on there, or even potentially running SCADA clients on that. So you could potentially run a SCADA client and your PLC all in one physical box. Now, if anyone asks you, don't tell me, don't tell them that I told you that, but that this is some of the whispers that I'm hearing. So uh, we've even got internal people at GE wanting some of those products. So they're developing it internal for uh, other GE customers as well as external people. But uh, to be able to turn up a site to one box that can do everything from your SCADA through to your PLC and literally just plug your I.O. in is really cutting edge. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Cool. Okay, so guys, if there's no more questions, um, I'd just like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we hope you found this information insightful, or at least provide you with some ideas to complement your business. Um, if you have any further questions, as mentioned earlier, please send us an email or give us a call. Um, to stay up to date in the latest in articles, tips, and general company company news, follow us on LinkedIn uh, by searching Control Logic Pty Ltd, or subscribing to our newsletter, or visiting our blog page via our website. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Have a great week, and we'll see you later.